Our next speaker is Brittany Rogers. Brittany holds a Master's of Science from the SUNY College of ESF. Um, she's leading efforts to protect aquatic priority conservation areas from the impacts of invasive species through early detection and rapid response efforts, and is leading multiple initiatives to enhance the health of aquatic ecosystems in our region. Please join me in welcoming Brittany Rogers. Hi, everyone. Welcome back from your break. My name is Brittany Rogers, as you just heard the wonderful introduction uh, that Lauren gave that I wrote myself. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. I always find that this conference is really technical and really full of information that everyone is really interested in learning about. And I'm gonna start by saying first, I apologize, I talk really fast sometimes. I'm really passionate about what I talk about and I get excited for it. So I'll try to make sure that I stay slower. And then second, you can probably hear a little bit of raspiness in my voice. I'm one of the lucky ones to deal with some long-term cold. So I'm still uh, unfortunately a little bit uh, without a voice. So I'm gonna do this. And uh, if you have any questions, my goal today is actually to walk away with giving you a ton of information and have you with a ton of questions. So you're not gonna get all the answers and get all the information you need. I want you to utilize our website, visit Megan and I at our table and reach out via email or phone, however you wanna do that and ask more questions about the work that we're doing and how we might all be able to collaborate together more. So by looking at the screen, you can see that I'm gonna talk about a huge plethora of things. Um, so like I said, I really wanna leave you with a lot of um, excitement and questions about the invasive species work that we're doing and really kind of thinking forward and how we might be able to collaborate more in the future as well. So first, if you don't know what Slilo Prism is, I really have to start there. So across New York State, we're really fortunate to have eight partnerships for regional invasive species management. Primarily, I work in the St. Lawrence, Eastern Lake Ontario region, so that's a five county region that we cover, and that includes a big portion of Eastern Lake Ontario as well as the St. Lawrence River. Our mission is to protect native bi biodiversity through a collaborative approach of invasive species management, so that means that we work really heavily with multiple partners across our region, so this is just a list of our formal partners, but this is not comprehensive of all of the people or the groups of the organizations that we work with. So this is just a, a good subset. Our funding actually comes from the Environmental Protection Fund through a contract with New York State Devi Department of Environmental Conservation, and we are hosted by the Nature Conservancy. Similar to the other eight prisms across New York State, we have some core programming that we focus on, and then we also have a huge pocket full of special initiatives that we participate in. And I'm gonna give you a glance at our core programming and then also kind of dive into some of the, the bigger initiatives that I participate in and the ones that I think are a little bit more relevant to you all in the room. So when thinking about invasive species, I'm not really defining them or kind of going in the in-depth of invasive species. I hope most of us in the room at least have an idea of what they are. But I just wanna talk about my presentation and how it kind of aligns with this invasion curve. And just so that when I'm jumping between projects, you're kind of thinking about this invasion curve. So really we start at the prevention level and work into early detection. So when we have lower populations of certain species, we're able to detect them early enough that we can potentially have some management for them and work to reduce their opportunity to spread and invade other areas. And then when you start getting more uh, populations of these different species, we have more of that long-term management aspect. So kind of thinking about this curve as I go through, I'll mention a little bit about this when I'm switching between topics throughout the day. So the first one I wanna talk about is our prevention program. In 2020, we were very fortunate enough to be able to expand our program across the, across the entire Slilo region in partnership and collaboration with the Thousand Islands Land Trust. And if you heard me just say 2020, everybody knows what that means. So that was our COVID year. So we expanded our program to almost 30 launches across our region. And then we had to figure out how to operate an outdoor uh, education program to voters and the public and having people uh, like Chelsea in the room going out and talking to people during COVID at times where people were not necessarily excited about talking to other people that they didn't know. So this was really awesome. This was, we had uh, 10 stewards that were able to come out. We covered almost 30 launches and we hit the ground running with 10,000 inspections. 
one thing with COVID that we found was that there was this huge increase in use of nature and natural resources. So we had this huge fluctuation of boaters that we did not expect. So we were out there for, uh, I think it was 6,000 hours, and we talked to a huge amount of people and really started spreading awareness about aquatic invasive species, really our program, till and kind of what we were about. One of the coolest things that I think came of this is that our stewards, when they talk to boaters, they actually collect a ton of data. So we have a really great information about boat launch usage, where people are coming from, where they're going to, what invasive species we're finding on them, what invasive species these uh, boaters or the people from the public might actually know about. And we created these really in-depth launch profiles for each of the launches we cover. If you're interested in any of that information, you can find it on our website. But I'm going to just talk about over the last four years, we were able to collect over four, or conduct over 40,000 total inspections, talk to 100,000 people, and we prevented 4, 000, over 4,300 invasive species from either being spread into our waters or to other waters as well. So that alone could not have occurred without the partners in the room. I've mentioned TILT a couple times. TILT was a huge part of that, state parks, DEC, and many other organizations in the room, including Save the River and more. So now I'm gonna step into from away from that prevention into the early detection. So one of the coolest ways that we're able to participate in early detection of invasive species is through eDNA sampling. And so without getting into the nitty gritty details, basically at the very minimal explanation, this is collecting for us one liter of water, bringing it to a genetics lab, and they can tell us what species DNA is in that sample. So in 2021, we were able to conduct a project through funding from the Arconic Foundation, which is in Messina. And so we were able to get funding to look at 15 different tributaries, and we were then able to also sample for a, a, a decent amount of invasive species as well as a couple native species. I know some people in the room might be uh, looking at the American eel uh, samples here that we actually were able to de detect American eel on some of our tributaries, which was super exciting. Um, one of the cool things too is that some of the invasive species that we didn't think were in our region, but we wanted to sample for them. Um, a lot of times aquatic invasive species are very cryptic and hard to find. So uh, eDNA sampling is a really good way to get after those species that we can't physically get our hands on. And so we did not find any of the Asian carp complex, the snakehead, and we did not find any swamp eel. And um, we were able to detect some tench tube nose goby rusty crayfish, and um, some of the, the ones that we expected to see. So then in 2022, we said, let's do it bigger. Let's look at, at more samples. So then we collaborated with the Adirondack Prism, and we were able to look at five major tributaries to Eastern Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River. So you can see those rivers here. And what we did is we strategically spread out samples along these rivers to try to one, detect species we were looking for, but then two, also kind of see where those populations might be coming from. So we were able to say if we got um, a detection on one of the third samples up the river, but then nowhere else above that, we could then go back and resample more closely and try to see if we can find a population of those species. So you can see that here, we did do a couple other spe specific sites, including Eastern Lake Ontario's watershed, and then some in the Finger Lakes, because one of the species we were looking for was hydrilla, which I'm really excited that we did not find any hydrilla, and that was one that we did not think was here, but we wanted to try to find out if it was. Um, so I know these graphs aren't like great for large rooms, so yeah, I'm not expecting you to read any of this, just expecting you to just see. So the green, uh, the little green squares, if you can see that coloration, that was a detection. And so we were able to detect, again, species that we expected. We did not have any unexpected uh, detections except for one, and that was for fanwort, which is a um, aquatic plant, and we actually went back and sampled a bunch more times. And we think what happened was that it was potentially introduced by boat, but it never established. One of the other cool things about eDNA is that, you know, we're trying to sample for species that are lower population, difficult to find, more cryptic, cryptic as I said. Um, going underwater is not the easiest place to work. So although I love it, not everybody does. Uh, we were really fortunate to also use an underwater ROV to also help take that next step of our work 
and get under the water with a camera and basically drive this remote operated vehicle in our sampling sites and try to get eyes on um, some of the species we were looking for. Again, we didn't get to see any of the species we were specifically looking for, but we did get some really cool video footage of others. And if anyone in the room is interested, so this is one of my pushes for collaboration, uh, is interested or know someone who wants to do some AI projects with video footage, I've got a ton of ROV footage that I would love to work with somebody to uh, not have me watch videos 100 times over and try to identify every little thing I see. So if anyone's interested, you know, spread the news on that. <laughs> Uh, so then I'm going to talk about our aquatic field surveys. So that's kind of more in our next level. So not really our prevention, early detection, but we're looking for species that are actually more established and that we might be able to respond to. So we go out to priority conservation areas in our region. Um, I work in a five county area. Most of you all probably work in big areas too or live in areas that it's really difficult to cover everything. So we have found sites that are um, areas that are considered considered high ecological importance through the New York Natural Heritage Program, or they have highly probable areas that invasive species would likely be introduced to. So in aquatic environments, we think boat launches, public access, motor boats, um, you know, even rental units on, on land, and then also if there's rare or protected species in those waters. Currently, this is our list of PCAs, but I'm very excited to share that I'm going to shake things up over the next five years. So this is gonna change a little bit. We aren't gonna do our same traditional sampling methods. We're gonna add a few new sites and start to explore a little bit more. And when I get towards the end of the presentation, I'm gonna ask for some help from some of you as well. Oh, I'm not doing very good with this. I'm sorry if I was lasering somebody out in the, in the audience. <laughs> oh. Thank you. Um, so talking about our survey methods, typically what we do out in the field is we um, have an app that we use, which I know it's really different than your paper and pencil. It's been really great. We use an app to collect a bunch of different data, including both native and invasive species at our sites and anything that we see. So this is one example of an invasive species frog bit. We report that through this data app and that all goes up into this online ArcGIS online system and is actually shared publicly. So if any of the information that we collect, anyone in this room can actually access it through IMAP invasives. One of the really exciting things is that when we're out on the water, we are going out to look for invasive species, but we're also trying to get a better understanding of what we're actually protecting. So we've been working with the New York Natural Heritage Program to get more information about the native aquatic plants that we're seeing out on the waters and sharing that information with them, collecting vouchered species to go to herbariums and get that stuff on record. Um, unfortunately, as I'll talk about a bunch, once you get under the surface of water, people aren't really participating as frequently or as much. So there's huge data gaps in what plants occur where. And so we're trying to make that change. And so for the last five years, we've been working really hard to get more of that information out there and into the, the other public systems. Even though my main focus is invasive species, I am obviously here to protect our native species as well. Oops, here I am lasering again. Sorry, Chelsea, that was on you that time. So I would be remiss to not talk about the terrestrial surveys as well. I know I'm trying to focus on my aquatic work, but we also work at PCAs for our terrestrial surveys. And uh, again, please don't try to read any of this. Um, I apologize that it's so small, but we have substantial amounts of information of the spread of terrestrial invasive species at our sites. And then all of this information that we're collecting and reporting in these apps, it goes into an online system and that informs our future management. So this is kind of what our online system looks like. So our future management is then, so this is including both manual, mechanical and chemical treatments of invasive species. Um, so you can see some polygons on here. The purple means that there is no invasive species detected there. And the orange, if you can see those small orange dots around this area, those are areas that we're actually doing either manual, mechanical, or chemical treatments. So then thinking about the aquatic environment, we don't do a ton of aquatic treatments, um, but one of the species that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, if it's not near you, you're probably scared of it for getting near your waters, but water chestnut. So this is just one example of where we've been able to report water chestnut and where it's been growing. And then this is an example where you see the red on here. So this is where we've actually conducted hand pulls. So sometimes when you see somebody out like me on the Asagachi River when we're doing hand pulls, 
I'm the one like entering all the data and stuff, maybe not participating as much as others. But this is really important information so that when people are trying to apply for grant funding, they're able to use this data and this information to uh, support their, their work and their proposals. Thinking about long-term management, so for species that are a little bit more established or a little bit more difficult to maybe treat chemically or manage mechanically, so with either machinery or by hand, uh, we have different biological controls that we also release. This is not my topical area. I love going out and releasing these insects. It's so much fun. If you haven't done it, please sign up to volunteer with us because it's fantastic. But we do release biological controls in collaboration with state parks and the New York State Hemlock Initiative for hemlock woolly adelgid. And so these are uh, parasitoids that, or these are beetles and silverflies that get released. So we've released uh, 6,000 of those. Then we have the emerald ash borer. So um, this was actually through a funding cycle. So we were only able to get pr approval for one site. And this was at Rice Creek Field Station at SUNY Oswego. And we were able to release 10,000 parasitoid wasps for emerald ash borer. And our goal is to get these biocontrols established and they only feed on, attack, or kill the invasive species. So they're very heavily researched. And then the bottom one you can see is Hypena opulenta. So we've worked with a ton of people in this room on Grenadier Island and Whaley State Park as well for those. Um, I don't have exact numbers because it varies year to year. So I apologize that that one I can't give you like a, a sweet number to, to share. Okay, so I'm gonna walk into our restoration work that I've been doing in riparian corridors that are important tributaries to Eastern Lake Ontario. The first one I'm gonna talk about is South Sandy Creek. And with thinking about this with our restoration work, we always start with an initial baseline assessment to look at our native and invasive species, and then also look at what the impacts are of those invasive species and how we might be able to manage them. Then we go and actually do the management and start following up with setting up for long-term monitoring as well as doing plantings. So this is a, a first example of our initial assessment. Basically what came from this, we looked at multiple tributaries. We got results from that for recommendations for restoration. And then the next following three years, we followed that up with actual restoration work. This was a really exciting project. So this was over a 30 acre site and the coloration and stuff probably does not mean much to most of you in the room. Uh, this is just a way for us to organize what species were going where and how close or how far from the water they were gonna be. Because we were working with so many volunteers, we had to be the most organized and possible beforehand so that we could just give people plants and send them to the locations that they knew they needed to be planted. Uh, one of the really exciting parts of this project is we were able to manage Japanese knotweed, phragmites, and goutweed, which some people might not know what goutweed is. It's a typical nur nursery plant that is from old homesteads. So it was found at this wildlife management area, and we were able to do some treatments for that as well. And then what we did is we actually conducted assisted population migration. So basically we selected species that were known to be native to our region, but then we found populations that were south of us and found nurseries that were able to provide those species from south of us and moving them up to our area with the biggest thing in mind with climate change and range expansions of different populations. So hopefully that will help some of our species that we planted be a little bit more resilient as the climate continues to change. Uh, this is just the list of species, but I would uh, just really wanna emphasize how important collaboration is even with this project. We had 45 people come out to this project in over 650 hours, we were able to plant 6,270 plants at this 30 acre project site. Um, it's not a super dense, but basically we were focusing in areas where invasive species previously were, and we were planting natives in, in that area. Um, our main goal is to suppress the invasive species and their impacts on the riparian areas and our waterways, but we also were able to support wildlife by selecting species that are plants that provide food, provide shelter, provide opportunity for carbon sequestration, improve water quality, as well as uh, the aesthetic value that some of these really cool plants provide. So next is our Eastern Lake Ontario Dune Restoration Project. So again, we started with that initial baseline assessment. We did uh, a full native species assessment at this site because the dunes in Eastern Lake Ontario have a substantial amount of rare plants and protected plants. So we really had to get an exact understanding of what was there, how dense it was. So we were able to identify over 107 native species at this site, which was super exciting for only a four acre site. 
especially a site that was pretty densely uh, impacted by Phragmites as well. So then we did three different methods for um, the Phragmites. We did some foliar applications, so that's like your typical backpack sprayers. And then we did hand wicking, which is really to focus in on those specific plants we're trying to treat. Um, so that we weren't impacting any of those other rare or protected species. And then also we had volunteers going out there all the time and just cutting all of the fun little stolens of Phragmites that can spread like 50 feet in what seems like a day. Um, so we had people going out and removing that as well to try to get the biggest bang for our buck. We were able to select 20 native species, again, thinking about that assisted population migration, bringing them up from southern regions. And we had 1,500 plants that were uh, planted in this area. <clears throat> I'm just going to get some water. So the final one I'm going to talk about is our PCA restoration work that we're doing. So this is a little bit more focused on smaller scale areas, so 1,000 square feet to maybe 1,500 square feet. And this is where we've done some invasive species management. So thinking about Japanese knotweed, pale swallowwort, phragmites, and most recently yellow iris as well. Uh, we've been going out removing these invasive species and then taking the opportunity to um, plant native species in as well. So that's really exciting. I just want to show a couple of pictures because to be fair, that's what everyone's here for. You guys all love to see fun photos. So this was one of our thousand acre, or thousand acre, thousand square foot sites. And it was 100% dense cover of Phragmites after a couple of years of treatment. We were able to get out, oh, so this is another density air picture. Um, after a couple years of treatment, we were able to get the Phragmites basically reduced down to about 10% was still remaining. So we're still doing more management, but we found that was a good opportunity for us to get in there and start planting before other invasive species popped in there. Um, so this is what one of our sites is. This one is one of the areas that actually floods frequently and is very, very much uh, impacted by different lake levels. So the natives that we selected were ones that were going to be able to actually thrive in either flooding or dry years. Um, but one of the really exciting species was uh, blue flag iris, and that was one that this site was our most successful site. We had almost 100% success of the plants that we planted at this site. So. I'm excited to go back and check it out. And if anyone wants to volunteer with us, you can come out and check it out too. So that was kind of like the huge rush of what's been happening over the last five years for Salilo Prism. And now we're gonna look ahead. Uh, we are actually in the process of receiving a new five-year contract. And so our work is slightly shifting uh, in very good ways, very exciting ways. But I just wanna kind of talk about some of the opportunities for all of you in the room. Um, this is hot news, so take some notes down and hopefully we'll, we'll see about some of these things. One of our biggest initiatives that we're really looking at is kind of transforming our thought process. So we've been really working towards thinking about connected corridors and connectivity and looking at the big picture. And we are focusing on connected lands and waters in our next five-year contract. So that includes areas like the A2A region, including the Frontenac Arch. You'll see that we are basically within the exact area of that right now. Um, thinking about our connectivity and the work that we're doing in the Great Lakes area, Eastern Lake Ontario or the St. Lawrence is actually impacting the rest of the Great Lakes Basin as well. And then the Nature Conservancy has identified the Blue Ridge to Boreal region um, as a really important corridor for connectivity as climate continues to change. If you look at all of those range charts, I'm not gonna show you all of those today, but as you're seeing those shifts with uh, the changing climate, you'll see that this corridor is a really important area to protect. It's over 2000 miles and it connects both US and Canada and we fall right within that as well. So kind of thinking about connected lands, connected corridors, riparian areas, and a lot of the aquatic way waterways that we work in, I'm gonna share some future opportunities with you. So the first one is that we do have funding slated for the next couple of years for restoration work to occur, similar to that South Sandy Creek scale project. So thinking 20 to 30 acres of invasive species management and um, work happening there. So we have funds for 25 and 26. So right now is when I'm starting to look for those project sites to work on. So if you have something that just comes right to mind, uh, contact me and let me know. Uh, really thinking about connectivity, protecting native species, the presence of invasive species at these sites, and then also risk of new invasions, which isn't something that I've talked a lot about, but typically when you do invasive species management, especially in our area, the first species we see popping back up are invasive species. So kind of thinking about that aspect, and then of course, um, species range shifts and climate change as well. 
So thinking about eDNA work, uh, I mentioned two of our projects. So we do have funding for the years 25 and 27. So we'll be expanding our eDNA work. And this is the map of uh, locations that we've sampled previously. But if anybody would like to collaborate on sites that should be sampled or would like to actually go out and help with sampling, uh, we'll be doing that for 25 and 27. This one is something that uh, my colleague Megan, which I think most of you in the room also know, uh, Megan and I have really been dreaming up for the last five years and we finally got the green light for this and we're really excited to work with all of you. And we're going to host for the public, for um, seasonal staff, for other staff around our region, anyone who wants to participate, uh, we'll do a aquatic invasive species learning experience. We're kind of coining it right now. Um, basically, we'll start with a virtual plant ID training and then we'll do an in-person hands ID plant training. So this is aquatic plants. We can definitely throw in some emergent species as well, because um, I know a lot of people are interested in those too. And then we'll actually go out on the water and teach people how to do surveys on their lakes, on their bays, and around their docks, and work with you all to start collecting data uh, with us and participating in community science with us. So we don't have exact dates, because we want to get people's um, excitement, get people to sign up and tell us when they're available because this is not for us, this is for everyone in the room. Um, so we just want to hear from you all when you want these events to happen. And I know you're also like, okay, I don't do enough in my life, how else can I help Brittany with her line of work? Um, so IMAP Invasives, I have to mention this, this is a tool that we use all the time. The data that gets uploaded is so important to us because I can't be everywhere and anywhere. My colleague Robert who's our terrestrial person, he can't be everywhere and anywhere. Um, so we just ask if you are seeing invasive species in your property or when you're out on hikes, take a picture of it and upload it to IMAP Invasives because you would be surprised how important that actually is to us. And we do see that. Okay, this is the part where I say stop listening to me. You can take out your phones if you want to. Um, if you haven't already signed up for the Pledge to Protect, Megan has some really sweet swag items. If you sign up now during this session, um, you can get some swag items at our table outside. And so if you scan the QR code, you can sign up to do that. Um, this is very simple. We send a monthly email with simple actions that people can take. And it's really focused on the seasonal timing. So winter, um, spring, summer and fall. So it's really focused on what you can do during that month. And then also we have lots of different opportunities and, and tools that you can also have access to by participating in this. Don't worry, this is not my last QR code. <laughs> All right, so if I haven't said it enough, I really hope that some of you, if you're already doing the work and already participating in invasive species work or um, assisting organizations like Tilt and Save the River and coming to some of our events that are co co-hosted by both organizations, then you should sign up to volunteer with us because if you volunteer for hours, you also get sweet prizes. Again, surprise. Um, but then also there's opportunity to really just get more information, connect with us more, and um, get out on the water, or get out on the trails with us as well. Because I know we're really fun people to hang out with. Um, so with that, I just really want to just say thank you to all of you that are in the room today. It's a Saturday. We're all here. You're all here to learn. I know I'm not super technical heavy uh, with my presentation, but I just want to say and just kind of leave you with the idea that by recognizing the work that we're all doing here on the St. Lawrence River in Eastern Lake Ontario and in our region and overall, our partnerships and our collaboration are the most important thing to be able to really move these initiatives forward. And I'm so excited to continue working with you all for the next five years. And I really hope that some of these projects get you excited. And I just wanna say thank you.